you would see like moms and like grandmas like taking their dogs for a walk and then you have this like you know no you have this way. gap they're there. just like uh <laughs> yeah just like walking by being like i wonder what's happening and then we'd like turn on our amps and you could see them just be like i'm fucking out of here like, i don't know <laughs> what this is <laughs> Thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. This is another episode of the Scoped Exposure Podcast via Isolation Edition. Uh, I'm super excited to be sitting down uh, with Steph. How are you doing? I'm doing real good. How are you? I'm doing great. Um, Steph plays in a number of different bands. Um, you're based out of Vancouver, but play in some international, I guess, bands as well. Um, but, mm-hmm. you know, for the few people that might not know who you are initially, can you just give like a proper introduction of who you are and uh, what bands you're a part of? Yeah. Uh, so I go by Steph Yurkova. Um, I, yeah, I'm a musician based out of Vancouver, BC. Uh, I play bass in Regional Justice Center. And I also sing in a band called Peanut of Damage. That's also like a Vancouver-based hardcore punk band. Uh, and I also sing and play in another band called Apple White. That's more like a shoegazy kind of band. Um, yeah. Awesome. And uh, yeah, I definitely want to touch on uh, Regional Justice Center because that band overall is, I think, very uh, interesting as far as, you know, musically, but also some of the things that you guys have done and just how that band functions. Uh, but mm-hmm. also wanted to talk about uh, Punitive Damage as well. Um, this this was actually going to be a podcast the episode that we were going to record uh, at Wild Rose, um, but because that's not happening, unfortunately, we're doing it this yeah. way. So, you know, make, making the best out of a, a shitty situation. Um, yeah, it's resourceful. It's cool. Yeah. So, um, so, Steph, I like to get a lot of context around how people got into, like, punk and hardcore music because it's one thing just to, like, jump into, like, this is where I am now, but I like to know what the lead up the comic book episode or edition 001, if you will. So <laughs> can you just tell me how you grew up, how – uh, certain records kind of influenced you to kind of get you into the bands that you're playing in now? Yeah. Um, so I actually like find myself to be really lucky that uh, I had a lot of my family get me into punk. So um, I'm actually from Calgary. I was born there. Uh, and my uh, brothers and sisters lived in like, o- like originally lived in like Okotoks and moved over to Calgary. And they are like, they were hugely into punk. Like they were a major influence to me. My older sister is like an encyclopedia of like every band. And she was like heavily involved in like Calgary punk, like way back in the day and same with my brother. Uh, my brother-in-law, uh, he played in uh, knucklehead, which is like a punk band based out of Calgary. Right. And you know, with them and my older brother, Mike, who would play in bands all the time. Like I was really lucky that I was just kind of forced into it. And I like forced maybe is not the nicest word to use, but, it was because of their constant influence that like I got exposed to like bands like Bad Religion, No Effects, Reaching Weasel when I was like in the third grade and the yeah. fourth grade. Wow. Uh, which is cool because like neither of my parents could give a shit about music like <laughs> at all. They right. could not care. So because of them and like watching, you know, my older brother play guitar in the living room and playing in these bands and going on tour, like it was like it made me really excited about music. Um and then, you know, in terms of like getting into hardcore, cause like my roots are in punk, which is actually kind of interesting. Cause I always thought that that's how everybody got into hardcore. But as I've gotten older, I see that a lot of my homies have gotten in through like emo music or screamo or like metal or like metalcore. Uh, so I was very much like rooted in punk, like warped for punk when I was like super young. Um, and then when I started getting into hardcore shows, this was around the time that like really iconic Vancouver bands had just started. Uh, ending so like go it alone blue monday um you know champion before they were canceled uh and then we have bands like keep it clear in stride like those were my first shows when i was younger right when i was like i want to say it's like i started going to shows when i was 15 and 
those were like, I think really what changed it up for me. My brother put Go to Loan um, Relics on my iPod and I was like listening to it and like grade 10 math. And I remember like my mind being fucking blown that there was like such an aggressive type of music that existed out there. Mm -hmm. um, and that's like what prompted me to like go to shows and start seeing like all these other bands and like go to Seattle to see tons of bands all the time and stuff. So yeah, I always felt like pretty lucky because a lot of like what got me into music was like my family and my friends. Like I didn't really have comp CDs of like all these like classic East Coast hardcore bands or, you know, LA hardcore bands or bands that were never in my community. It was like all people who are my friends now and all of their music that got me into hardcore, which is pretty cool. Cause I feel like Vancouver, I think people tend to miss Vancouver or like kind of put it aside of what we had going on for a minute. Yeah. but. You know, it was popping off for like a hot minute. Like there was a lot of shit that was happening. There was a lot of really cool bands. So I'm, I've always been like real thankful for that. Yeah, yeah, and like I, I've listened to other podcasts with certain guests, um, who, at least on the outside, are people that like live and breathe like DIY style kind of music. And you know, mm -hmm. like then they break it down as like, oh, it was because my dad was so um, encouraging of like certain things or some other fam family member was like really pushing that and um i think that's a that's a good thing as far as what you you said like you weren't you couldn't get away from it i guess is maybe the best way to say it it was just your environment yeah. excuse me i got something in my throat um <laughs> i know yeah i think that there's um a lot of really good like vancouver bands that really were staples that kind of pushed you know in that direction um were you so did you only start going to shows once you had moved to vancouver or did you do anything in calgary uh before you guys moved so i was born like we moved when i was like hell a little so oh, okay. i calgary at this point is like mildly a technicality right. um, my, my family still lives there so like i go to calgary all the time but you know it's, i didn't really start i didn't really go to calgary shows all that much even when i was in town to visit um and i think a large part of that just had to do with like i didn't know anybody right um i'm a pretty like shy reserved person uh especially like way back then too like i was scared of everybody when i went to hardcore shows everybody has like the meanest resting bitch face and like everyone's got like their arms crossed and, like no one's talking to nobody except their homies so that compounded with I'm fucking scared of everybody. Right. Like I never really went out to shows or like got to know people. I'd say until like maybe four, like four or five years ago. Right. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think that there, there is like a, a weird thing to kind of like everyone's first show ex experience is always really weird. It's like, it's always a friend, you know, being like, Hey, come out to this. And then it's like, I don't know anyone here. So I'm like, just going to magnet magnetized to this person just so i'm not like left to be abducted by like all these scary dudes or, or whatever it is um yeah but yeah like i think that's really cool to hear how like you were listening to stuff like so little and you know your brothers were just like handing stuff off to you like super easily um when did you originally start like playing music yourself when it was like I know that you play bass, but I don't know if you started with guitar and then moved to bass or something else. I started with bass um, and I started pretty young too. So I think I was like, I distinctly remember my brother giving me a copy of Green Day's Dookie uh, on CD on like his CD player. He got a new one. So I got his hand me down that would always skip. Um, and I think I was in like the fifth or sixth grade like I was pretty young and like he had just started playing in bands all the time like he got like his like Epiphone Les Paul and like his like combo amp and stuff and like because he started doing it I was like I want to do that too right and so he's like here's a CD here's my old bass like you like he would like lock me in my room and be like all right figure it out and <laughs> I was like yo do you have any like tabs that I could use or something and he's just like we don't do tabs in this household you learn by ear or you don't learn at all Whoa. like <laughs> He's like, let's it must... straight, yeah. <laughs> no, it was just funny. Like, uh, you know, my family, like, we grew up pretty poor. So a lot of, like, what we had to do, like, we had to figure out for ourselves. Sure. And we had to be pretty resourceful. So I think a lot of that came into music, too, right? Like, mm. we never had, we could never afford, like, guitar lessons. We couldn't afford, like, going to Long McQuaid or, like, whatever the, like, after-school programs were. Like, we had to figure out everything on his own. So he was always very quick to be like, 
you need to figure that out on your own yourself. Yeah. Uh, so I started off with bass and I remember like, oh God, I can't remember what the song was, but I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm never going to be able to play an instrument. Like, this is the hardest thing in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, but I kept at it and it was super fun. And um, I didn't really start like playing in bands until way later uh because i grew up in like the strip like the suburbs of vancouver so i grew up in the city called surrey mm-hmm. yeah. uh, and there wasn't a lot like there was there's no surrey bands right like it's like everyone either lived in like vancouver proper or like way out in langley for like a hot minute um but the funny thing is is like when i first started learning and like when i first wanted to start playing in a band i did not want to be a bass player at all that was like the <laughs> one instrument that i was like there's no fucking way that I'm going to be the person playing bass. And a lot of that was just rooted in the fact that um, it was like expected of me to be the bass player because I was a girl. Mm. And people always said like, that was also like the period of time in bands where like people would like openly so fucked with the things they would say about women. Like, you know, saying things like, I remember like the B Nor b9 board sort of stuff saying like if i see there's a girl in a band i immediately dismiss it because i know it's gonna suck or like yeah. that was like the era of jokes where people are like why don't you take girls on tours because they'll bleed all over the merch like weird shit like that mm. so because that was almost like an expected stereotype of me i was like there's no fucking way i am playing that stupid instrument because that's what they expect me to play so i'm gonna learn how to play guitar mm-hmm. uh so i kind of forced myself how to play guitar and a lot of the band, like the really shitty bands that I first started off with, like I insisted on playing guitar and I wasn't bad, but I wasn't great either. And it wasn't until I got kind of coerced into joining this like youth crew straight edge band that they were like, we really need a bass player. And I was like, I don't want to, but okay, I'll do it. And then since then I was like, it just kind of clicked. Like I was good at it. Right. And I was like, well, I might as well stick with this. Yeah. And it's not been the same ever since. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a few things there, uh, that like, I, I hope that we can kind of dive into, but I think, you know, first off you were mentioning that like, because of your upbringing, it was like, you weren't just handed things as far as like the knowledge or, you know, I don't, I don't know even if things like at least online, like for YouTube, you YouTubing things like wasn't even really as common then. Um, yeah. but I think that's, you know, that's a big thing. You know, I think that's that resiliency or that perseverance in, in hardcore punk music to, to make it happen because mm-hmm. I don't know any other genre of music where, you know, band members can't play. So instead of default, like inst- the default isn't to cancel the show. It's like, okay, how can we teach people how to play the these songs in 12 hours or like oh like i broke a string i'm gonna be upset it's like hey does anyone have a guitar and drop c or whatever it is Um, there's always like just keep pushing forward and you know being headstrong in that sense um and and the second point that um i wanted to maybe touch on um i i think that's interesting that you know there that bass as an instrument you felt like oh it's a it's expected of me because i'm a girl to play yeah. that and so that pushed you into other ways um but at the same time like you know you can really tell when someone's like really really good at bass and just like you know and you can also tell when someone's like like it's kind of like uh, like when someone's not so good at guitar it's like y- you can kind of tell some of those things so i think yeah. it was uh <laughs> it was kind of funny to uh to hear you kind of championing that and being like i don't i don't give a fuck what anyone says like i'm gonna rock this space and i'm gonna do it well um yeah i think that was kind of because i think the thing that a lot like i'll fully admit i don't think i'm a very good guitar player i'm like competent but like it's just it's not for me right. um and i also think like there's always like there are people who can play bass and there's bass players so they're two very different things in my eyes and that like that make, I feel very smug saying that, and I definitely don't intend to sound smug with that, but I think, like, a lot of people kind of underestimate the importance of, like, you know, this other part of the rhythm section that, like, really holds down. And, like, I think can really make or break a lot of, I think can make or break, especially, like, in hardcore, like, that is a real significant thing. Um, 
And it's like, it's hard to play, right? Like the strings are heavier, your hands get tired, your hands hurt a lot more. Yeah. Um, and it's always funny to me because I had to like, I have a lot of friends who'd be like, oh yeah, I can do this shit, no problem. And then they would try and like record bass on something and they'd be like, yo, my hands were hurting so bad trying to do that. That was way the fuck harder than I expected it to be. Right. And like, I can't help but feel like a little bit smug in the back of my mind. Cause I'm like, oh, you think it's so fucking easy, dude? Yeah. <laughs> no, I think, I think you're absolutely right that, that there are people who can play bass and then there's bass players and like, mm. uh, like there are a few bands, at least off the top of my head where I'm like, oh yeah, like. I like this band a lot more because their, you know, bass and drum section is so tight knit. Um, yeah. Versus just someone who's just playing a octave lower with less strings in a way. Yeah, um, totally. Yeah, and then so so what were kind of the some of the first bands that you kind of started because and, and maybe you don't need to go to like this is the very first band I did because some people were like oh I don't like this is the first credible band at least that uh that i was playing in like for punk or hardcore or whatever it is because at least for me it's like the very first band i played in is like a pop punk band that i don't like i like all right let's skip that and the one after <laughs> before we go to the the real honorable mentions in a way <laughs> I, I definitely yeah i had a, so i played in this one i'm not going to say the name of it because i don't want people finding this demo because that band was legitimately atrocious but like i played in this one band uh it was the first band that like played shows that's kind of my barometer for like what was like the first band so the first band that i started playing shows in i was 15 years old it was with a bunch of people um from langley uh this was around the time that i started going to shows by myself okay because i couldn't convince my friends at high school to come with me and this is where i started meeting these other people so i met this crew from langley and we started this band uh, and I played guitar in it and I was like, yeah, I was like 15 years old or so. Um, we didn't do anything. We recorded a demo off of tapes and like, we played a couple shows in Vancouver and then that was that. Right. Um, but the first band that I think most people at least remember like way back when was the, this youth crew straight edge band called out of sight. Okay. Um, so like that's with like, uh, you know, Chad and James and Alex who played the Keep It Clear. Mm -hmm. uh, that was the band that I got coerced into playing bass for. And, you know, that was a, it was just like dumb youth crew straight edge, right? We got to play uh, shows. We did like a little stint over to um, Calgary, which was real cool. Uh, and it's funny because like a lot of people that like I'm friends with now, I met playing those shows, but like I just didn't remember them at the time. Right. Um, but that band was like, as cheesy as it was, it was still pretty cool too. Cause I remember being like, I think I was like 17 years old when we got to play the React Showcase down over in uh in Gilman. So like over in the Bay Area. Yeah. And I was still living with my mom at the time. And like my, my parents are uh my mom's Mexican. So it was very much like I stayed at home. I did not fucking go out and do anything, let alone hang out with boys or travel with boys. Yeah. So I had to lie to her saying that I was like going to go to sleepover to the island while I was actually crammed in a van with like 17 other dudes doing the overnight <laughs> drive down to Gilman um, for like the weekend. So we like went there, we put the show, we stayed for a day and then we fucking like booked it back home. Right. Uh, and that like kind of gave me a taste of being like, oh shit, I really like playing music. I really like doing stuff. Right. Yeah. It's, it's always funny to hear some of those, um, uh, those lies or those like, exaggerated truths um because i think like unless a, I, I vet i've met very few people where their parents have played live music and they've toured so they like get the whole like jump in a you know in a car with like a bunch of strangers to drive 12 hours to go to a show and then drive back the next night um yeah so you know like some like whether you want to be up front or like i know the answer is going to be no so i have to like craft <laughs> my own uh my own way into this uh yeah i'm i i've definitely told my my fair amount of tales to like make sure i could go on a trip or or whatever it is um i still like to this day have to do that like i don't i, I don't live with my mom but like i'm close with my mom so like i talk to her about everything but like straight up like if i'm going on like rjc tour or something like i fucking just lie and i say i'm going on a road trip with my homies that are all girls because she would have a fucking heart attack <laughs> if she knew that i was in a van with like three or four other dudes um for like weeks at a time right. so like to this day 
as a grown ass fucking human being who doesn't live at home, like I still have to be like, my mom can't figure this shit out. Right, right. Yeah. And you kind of hit on um, maybe a little point that we can dive into just like, you know, talking about being, you know, the minority in the band as far as like being the only girl with a lot of dudes or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. I think, you know, I, I've... I've met a lot of people and like, I think on the outside, there might be a little bit of like, like misconceptions as far as like what that's actually like, as far as like, you're just like, well, what about this? It's like, it's just another person like in the band. So um, maybe like what were, did you have any hesitancies at least in your first couple like tours like that, where like you were like, I don't know how things are going to go as far as like either being accepted or whatever or like what's maybe the biggest lesson you've learned um to kind of break some of those maybe misconceptions i totally went straight for it like that never crossed my mind whatsoever um because i just wanted to play shows like that's what i wanted more than anything um especially like in a city like Vancouver, like there's a lot of bands here. There's a lot of bands that don't do anything. Right. Right. We're kind of like pigeonholed between the border and having to sneak across that, or you got the Rocky mountains and like a 10 hour drive before it's the next major city. Yeah. Um, so I didn't really think about that when I was first starting. Cause I just wanted to jump in. Um, at the t- it's funny because like, this was like 10 years, this was like well over 10 years ago at this point that I started playing in bands. So I, how it was then versus how it is now are like two very different things. Okay. Back then, um, you know, there was still, I never really faced any like outward, like misogyny or shittiness, which was pretty cool. Um, but definitely like just a lot of weirdness from a lot of guys, like, cause also like hardcore people are so fucking awkward to begin with. Like we're just awkward human beings in general and you throw a girl into the mix and then everyone gets like awkward times 20. Um, but I would, I used to actually do this thing where I would cut my hair really short. So like, I, like, I would cut my hair like to my ears, essentially. Um, I'd have like these boy haircuts and I would always wear like jeans and band shirts. So I'd actually kind of do a lot to underdress myself so that it wasn't like immediately apparent that I was a girl. Right. Um, because at the time I didn't want to draw attention to myself, not in the sense that like, I think people are going to be like up in my business but I didn't want that immediate kind of awkwardness to come in that I was a girl Mm. so it was something that like I definitely was mindful of um because there would be shows where I would play where people would immediately like you know people would be immediately weird to me for no apparent reason whatsoever so we play a show and like the other bands that were playing the same show that us would go up and say good set to everybody in the band and then completely walk past me Mm. or like everyone always assumed that I was in a band because like I was like you know just there to like sleep with the dudes or something so there was a lot of that at first like really put a chip on my shoulder yeah and like left a bad taste in my mouth a couple times but you know I also hear like the stories that like my other friends who had like played in other bands and like the shit that they would tell me even just being like promoters like not even being musicians like promoters at the time and just the fact that they were a girl was so fucking whack um but you know that's like i would say like 2000 2009 2010 ish was the different time whereas now um i would say it's a literal non-issue like yeah. i don't think anybody bats an eye yeah at like the fact that i'm a girl if anything like people seem like more excited to talk to me which is like also really cool too right because i feel like i the spectrum where i originally started off was i don't fucking exist to being recognized and like being treated with respect and like being treated the same as everybody else, which is ultimately all I've ever wanted. Like I did, I've never really wanted to have any kind of like special status or to be treated differently. I'm like, I just want people to talk to me the same way they talk to my homies. Yeah, That's all it has to be. Yeah, And I would say like, now I was thinking about this the other day when I was going for Uh, a walk like how thankful I am and like how lucky I am that I get to be in hardcore now and today with like all the different types of people that I know um and like my place in it as well and like how comfortable I feel in it like Mm -hmm. I'm beyond lucky and I'm like real thankful and psyched because of that yeah yeah I think like overall like the the community 
has really come a long way as far as like having proper not even proper but just like representation for like you know mm. like you know girls doing vocals like like all girl bands like indigenous people like like the list yeah. goes on and on as far as like you know you go to a show and you see a band and like for me it's like i don't even really it was like oh i have to like this band because it's like a mix of whatever it's like is the music <laughs> good and you know like i'm even more excited if the music is good and there's like you know diversity i think is always like super important um yeah i feel like um uh, like peter the damage just recently did our tour with scowl and i thought that that was super bomb that it was like the touring band consists of two girls who are fronting the bands yeah um but like uh you know people were super hyped on it and like if, if somebody were to say that to me like when i first started going to bands like this is going to be a thing you're going to see and it's going to be like hardcore punk bands not like pop bands or whatever right. if someone had told me that i legitimately would not believe them so i'm like that there's no fucking way that a people would want to see that and b that that's a good place that i'm going to be at yeah yeah because like i don't know like there was I, like i'm having flashbacks to this one show that we were filming at um I don't know if you know the venue Broken City here in Calgary, but it was um, Waster, Snake Pit, which is like a local band here. And then like there was these two other bands that were kind of weird and I was like filming them. But like one of the girls, uh, there there was a band that uh, there was it was more like rock singy. Like it was kind of a weird, a weird show, but she was like yeah. dressed exactly like Daphne in a way, like from Scooby-Doo. <laughs> And I was like, I was like, yeah, this is cool. But it like, like for me, it always kind of feels disingenuous when a band, like if, if someone wants to dress, however, like go for it. But when there's like, it's all kind of centered around that musically too. It just kind of feels like I lose touch with it personally. Um, I just, yeah. I like seeing whoever, however you identify like rocking out, like that's, that's, that's what gets uh, me excited to see yeah, people like, express themselves uh, that way oh sorry i didn't mean to interrupt oh, no, you no worries um that was like one of my favorite things with um that's actually like one of my favorite things about scowl so i don't know like if you check them out or if like you know what like everyone in the lineup looks like but their singer cat she is so fucking cool because when i first heard those vocals i was like damn this dude sounds fucking crazy like this is cool this sound this guy sounds mean and then you see her and she's got these like fucking huge like fake eyelashes this like super gorgeous makeup like the cutest outfits ever like she's like a very well-dressed super beautiful woman and it's like you have this person who's dressed up like really cutesy and then sounds fucking psycho <laughs> cool. at the same time yeah. and i love that it's just like nobody's batting an eye and being like this doesn't add with this they're just like yep this is this is the vibe this is scowl they love flowers she sounds fucking maniacal this yeah. is cool we are into it mm -hmm. I, I do want to uh, get into uh, that tour that you guys did because that was kind of like in the midst of this whole like quarantine-ness. Um, and oh, I saw gosh. that you guys played under a bridge. Um, but before we like kind of change gears, um, I know like there's a topic because uh, I think this would, you know, we're we're on this path and I think this would be a good thing to hit on too. Um, yeah. The term female-fronted hardcore is like kind of not popular, but it's been used a lot. And like, I've read yeah. a lot of the comments on, on my channel and there's a fair number of bands where, uh, the vocalist is, is a girl. Um, mm. and then people will naturally be like female fronted, knocked loose for dying wish. And I'm like, no, not really. And, uh, yeah. you know, that like, that's, you know, I think when I'm not sure as far as like the history of how that term came to be, I think, maybe the mm -hmm. intentions were good to be like oh yeah like support girls in bands like for whatever yeah. reason but to skew that to be a genre i think there's a problem there because you know yeah. punitive damage sounds so different than like mortality rate for example to mm -hmm. a band like dying wish or no right or scowl um mm -hmm. so maybe from like a girl's perspective can you like you know, kind of correct the record for anyone who's watching who's like, well, no, it's supposed to be a good thing. I like the, so I definitely, I like, I, I think the first thing to address is like, I do think people's intentions 
are in the right place. Sure. Like, I don't think people are doing it to like put us in a box to like dismiss us or to like, you know, denigrate us. Um, so I do like, I'm not going to go after somebody who says that and like aggressively educate them and be a fucking dick about it. Cause like, I don't think people are doing it out of bad intention. I think it's just misguided. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because, you know, I think maybe at least like the way that I see it is I think that there was a point in time where there were, there were more women slash femme folk fronting bands and it wasn't happening very often and i think in an attempt to be supportive people yeah people wanted to be like you should support these bands because that has like a non-cis het dude at the front yeah but it it i i personally really don't like it because it's drawing unnecessary attention sure. like we're at a point right now where that doesn't need to be addressed because i think like if you were to switch that phrasing out with like anything else, it sounds a little strange and out of place. Right. So you'd be like, True. Oh, this is a dude fronted hardcore band. Like that doesn't fucking tell me anything about the band. That could mean a million things. Right. right? Or you mm -hmm. would be like, this is a, a Mexican fronted band. Like what the fuck does that have to do with anything right now? Like it's, it's irrelevant to the type of music. And while you think that you could be doing something good, I get it. It's just, there's no point to it. Cause yeah. yeah, like what you were saying, like mortality weight, right. Uh, Dying wish. And like all these other bands, like we don't sound anything like, no. so to put us all in the same bucket, just it like, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Um, so I like, I've had people say like, you know, like, Oh, this is like a female friendship band. And like my initial reaction isn't to be like, I'm going to fucking blast you on social media and shame you. It's just like, I get what you're trying to say, but you know what? Like it's 2020. It, it's irrelevant at this point. Like don't, don't sweat it. Just call us a band like everybody else. Cause that again, we just want to be the same as everybody else. Like I don't want someone to be like, I like this band because it's female front. It's like, I like this band because this person sounds fucking crazy. And this band rocks ass. Like yeah. that should really be your barometer for checking out a band. Yeah. And I, and I think like it's almost lazy to describe a band as girl version of uh, some other band and especially like a really popular band. Like I like I don't know what the video is. So if someone finds that person, you can expose them or whatever. But when I saw like someone comparing Dying Wish to Knock Loose, but with girl vocals, I'm like, no, like there yeah. are some like some differences, like what your palette a little bit more musically to like, you know, critique it maybe a little bit better um yeah exactly yeah, yeah. it's exactly it it's yeah. just it's just an unnecessary detail at this point like i wouldn't sweat it don't yeah. worry about whether this band is fronted by a girl or not just check out the band because you fucking like them if you put something as like female fronted to dismiss it then i'd be like oh, okay well you're trash that sucks like yeah. don't be like that but yeah but yeah. but i think it's different like you know uh something that we put out in the last few days here is um we're gonna do like a spot a weekly spotify playlist and so like mm -hmm. i've been writing out ideas as far as like how to do themed weeks as far as like you know heavy hitters or like songs under a minute and like it bands that only start with the letter s or like just random shit and i thought yeah. about like well like because i because i really think you know not only this conversation is valuable but i want to kind of push that idea like female fronted is not a genre so i thought about yeah. even just like having one week just be bands with girls in them and just showing like listen yeah. how diverse things can get and you know like i think it's important what you said it's like you know i don't think anyone who's playing in certain bands wants special atten attention because they um are a, min a minority of some magnitude it's just like just show yeah. me respect and like hopefully you like my music and if you don't then whatever yeah exactly yeah cool um sweet so let's jump back to some of the bands that at least you're playing in right now um mm -hmm. probably the biggest being like regional justice center i feel like that's might be where people know you the best or the biggest yeah. band for sure um yeah so 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 I've filmed Reno Justice Center only once. They came through Calgary with Ingrown back in 
what is that now 2018 something like so, that yeah. yeah yeah and uh you weren't in the band at the time um and I've, I've noticed a theme as far as um where that band is kind of like a musical chair as far as who's playing you know guitar or certain things on different tours uh but ian yeah. is obviously the uh the center as far as vocals and, and drums but maybe yeah. you can talk about how you were introduced into that band and how you got linked up to to play bass yeah. Uh, so I, I've known Ian for a super long time. So I first met him when he lived at this, like, I, like, I would, I would say like it's an iconic punk house in Seattle. It's called the Dangler. Um, uh, that band I played in out of sight, we were recording our LP, uh, and he lived at the house at the time. Gotcha. And the first time I met him, I remember he, like, he's super friendly and super nice. But like one of the first things he said to me is just like, yo, you sound like you're from Minnesota. And I was like, what the <laughs> fuck excuse me <laughs> and like he was just being like nice and playful um and so we knew each other from like that's where we first met and then like we knew each other from like the bands that he would play in so like we would play shows together um all the time and then so when regional justice center popped up uh they played in new west right. they played in new west at the time and i wanted to go see them because i love ian and i wanted to go hang out with him so i got to watch them and like, I would be a hundred percent honest, and this will be a little surprising to some people, but like, I did not give a shit about power of violence. I could not fucking care about pilot violence in any capacity, whatso fucking ever. Right. But because it was my homie, and he was doing something that had a lot of substance to it, and like was something personal and different, that got me more into it. Sure. And so. You know, Ian has always been really supportive of me as a musician with like other bands that I had played in. Like he had always been really supportive of me. And, you know, like him just talking about like RJC and stuff. But the whole rotating cast is honestly to keep up with like Ian's ability to go on tour all the time. So, sure. you know, because he's able to, you know, kind of make his own work schedule and stuff, like he can make the time for any tour to happen. Whereas most normal people can't. Right. So the whole rotating cast was basically to accommodate these tour schedules. So these things would come up, like these tours would come up. And, you know, not everybody can tour like a bajillion weeks out of the year, right? Like most people can do like a couple weeks out of the year. So it was just finding people that he liked and just being like, can you do this? Okay, great. Come on in. Yeah. And so we had talked about me playing in RJC for a minute and I was, I was super down. I wanted to play a bunch and I was actually supposed to play. Uh, I believe I was supposed to play that tour, but um, oh, okay. maybe it was that tour or it was another one. There was one of those I was supposed to play, but unfortunately um, I had to deal with like a lot of personal issues. Like I had a lot of family members who were really sick at mm -hmm. that time. Yeah. So like there was one tour I was supposed to do. It might've been that one that I was straight up like, I, I fucking can't. Like I had to bail last minute because of all these other things I had to attend to. Um, but, and then I think I, the first time I started playing with RGC was the 2019 winter tour when we played the American South. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was like when I was actually able to, cause like there are a bunch of times where like I was almost able to and I would just miss it by like, because there was a date I couldn't do or some other kind of circumstances happen. So like, there was a lot of chances to be like, can I do it? I couldn't, can I do it? I couldn't, can I do it? I couldn't. And then finally I got to the one where I was like, yes, I can do this, let's go. Right. And uh, like, as far as uh, the other, like, is it kind of like, I'm kind of curious on the logistics if Ian just has like a group text with all these potential guitar players and bass players and then being like, hey, I can do this in three weeks. Um, is, <laughs> is there like kind of a, like is it kind of like okay so and so is first up and if they can't do it then it's you know you go down the baseball bench in a way uh or is it kind of just like um oh we want to do things as a five piece or let's just do it as a as a four piece because i the first time i saw uh the band was it was as a three piece but i think you guys have expanded a little bit now to doing four members yeah it sounds better it sounds better with two guitars yeah. like it sounds good but it's just more fun with two guitars um i think it was just a lot of it is just finding people who like you know there could be a show that's happening in um la for example and it could be like a one-off show so like we have like there's homies at 
you know, have played before that could just as easily like fill in and like play those shows. That's like, it's just logistically easier to get together and like yeah. practice versus like me flying down and like doing all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Alex is always consistently playing guitar in every show. So it's just like seeing who's down and seeing who's able to like, sometimes just some people can't cause they have like other things that they have to do. Um, or like, cause all of us play like in a bunch of other bands as well. So it's also a matter of like, you know, this person can't do this because they're on tour. This person can't do this because they're like recording or some stuff. So mm -hmm. it's like finding that nice group of like people that you trust and you really enjoy spending time with. I think he's done like a good job of like narrowing that down. And it's just a matter of like who can and who can't. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's like a little, like, it's probably a little bit nicer to like not have like the insane, like, responsibility of like always having to be at like certain gigs when it's like oh if i'm feeling the pressure to like i have personal stuff or family stuff in the mix and like i can't do it it's actually not gonna fully lose the opportunity for the band like other people have the chance to step up in a way yeah totally yeah. that's yeah and that's like kind of the nice thing too um although i like i will admit i try my hardest to like jump on everything just because i love getting to like go out and play and especially like playing RJC stuff too like I try my hardest to like jump on every single thing that I can or like um you know I'll fucking lie through my teeth at work to like <laughs> get the time off to like go play a show or go fuck off for like a week like right. I will I will do anything to play because it's just it's fun man yeah. like it's the most fun and those guys are so great yeah what's what's been like maybe one of your favorite opportunities that you've gotten to do with that band um you know we got to like we did that full u.s tour which was like super awesome i never thought i was going to be able to do anything like that and that was like a crazy move of like i quit a career job to go jump on that tour because it was like what i wanted to do more than anything so we did that and then we like came home for like a week and then we toured japan right afterwards so getting to tour japan was actually kind of mind-blowing to me so i feel like with a lot of people in bands especially like punk and hardcore bands Usually, like, you do some sort of, like, West Coast, East Coast tour, and then you eventually play Europe at some point. Yeah. I have still never fucking played Europe. Like, this is one of my, like, goals that I'm trying to get to. And, like, all my friends have been like, oh, I've played there, like, three or four times. Like, just so blasé about it. So that's been, like, the one place I've been trying to play the most. And, that, like, with other bands, like, thankfully to cool opportunities, like, I instead have played countries like Japan, uh, or like other bands I played Cuba like those were like my first international tours but like Europe is still fucking not there <laughs> um but like definitely playing Japan because I legitimately never thought that I would be in a band that I would get to do that or that people would want to do that mm -hmm. let alone how it actually happened mm -hmm. um and playing Japan was really really fucking cool yeah yeah, like I, I was kind of scrolling through your your IG feed just before we were on the call, just kind of like being like, like the Japan thing, I think I saw went, while that was happening, but the Cuba, I was like, oh, like, you know, like there are some places in the world that you almost don't think about, like there's a punk Cuba scene. Um, oh, dog. Yeah. So like, um, you know, like something that, you know, at least that I'm trying to do with like our platform is like showing that like Western Canada as a whole has like scenes and multiple cities and we have good bands that are, you know, making waves as far as like touring and, you know, putting out good releases. Um, yeah. what, what was maybe like the biggest takeaway for some of those international tours that you did as far as like, wow, like these people like really, really appreciate that this, you know, you know, I'm just this like small person from Vancouver, but like mm -hmm. even just the small band from the States, like to, to fly over and, and play these shows. Like what was, um, what was the biggest thing that surprised you about that? Yeah. So I'm also going to clear up that RGC didn't do Cuba. That was another band I played in. Oh yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. I, so, I, I meant to, I should have separated it there, but yeah, you no, played realized... both, but not that band. <laughs> No, I realized when I said that, I was like, oh no, this sounds confusing. Let me fucking fix that real quick. Yeah, yeah. Um, there, the two th I will say that like, um, two things that I, at least I have noticed between the two um, is that playing in those countries, people have a, are just way the fuck more hyped on coming to see you 
and seeing a band play because we are so used to having like we're so fucking oversaturated with the different types of bands that we have like yep. one we have like access to you know i would say like north america is where most i would say like is where hardcore happens right sure yeah and you know we're kind of the first to know about it and it's really easy for us to know through like our friends and everything and like we can go and fly to the east coast in a couple hours to go see any bands like there is a lot for us here in canada and the united states and then whereas in those countries like those scenes aren't as fucking big and it's even things that like those scenes aren't as big because even just something like getting access to an instrument or a space or getting an amp is not as easy as it is here right like sure you know yeah. People only get this, but like we can go to fucking Long McQuaid and like walk out with a guitar and pay like 20 bucks for it, right? Right. And uh, we have so many things that we could look through. We can go through Craigslist, everybody's selling their shit all the fucking time. Uh, and then you know, you go to like the thing that I noticed in like Japan is like places are small, like I nobody has like a jam space that's like a garage or like the basement of a house like everything's so small and compact right. so like you have to go to these studios which are also really small and compact to go to these venues which are also really small and compact yeah. um because it's like you know it's a city that's built on top of itself so there's obviously like there are bands that are happening but not to the same magnitude as us and i think it's we don't realize that like we can get shit so easily we can make stuff happen so easily and there's a lot of those challenges that happen over there so when you go to play places like that bands touring from other countries is like kind of a like it's a bigger deal and more people are going to go out of their way to see what's up and they're not going to be afraid to be psyched on it too right um that's the thing i noticed about japan and cuba was that if people are psyched on it they're gonna fucking tell you Whereas like here, everyone's like, you know, we're like, everyone's cool, like cool guy mentality. Everyone's like, six cents, that was fucking bunk, bro. Yeah. Like cool. very kind of like, we're trying to like be chill. Um, whereas their people are like at the front and they're super pumped and they're just fucking like, they won't, they just want to talk to you all the time. Yeah. And I really like that. Cause like, to me, that's pretty refreshing. Uh, and it's also, it kind of makes me realize like, fuck, I'm really lucky that, you know, I complain that like Vancouver's a city that's kind of closed off on its own but i'm like yeah i'm closed off on its own but i can still get to wherever the fuck and see most other bands pretty quickly whereas people in these countries can't yeah no i think that's actually a really good point like um that like as you were saying that like it had a flashback because i know like uh sunny has gone over to japan a couple times now like filming with with some different bands for certain fests um and i remember he was he he put out a drum cam video and it's and someone commented like why does this like they were using like b8 symbols like the cheapest stuff that you can get your hands on and they were complaining because like the symbols sounded shitty but like yeah. not knowing like you know like it might be a lot harder for these people to get like quote unquote good or stapled gear choices and you know having to work with like what they can physically get their hands on i think that's a really interesting thing that most people probably didn't realize oh yeah it's yeah. like the level of access we have to shit up here is like it in comparison to like a country like a country like cuba is just it's wild dude it's night and day yeah and like you don't think about that though like you get mad like i don't know i'm thinking of like some fucking nerd friends of mine who get like really hyped on gear and they'll be like annoyed because the shop doesn't have like the specific type of fucking sg that they wanted or it's like oh you know i like this guitar but i don't really like this type of pickups or like yeah the you know the finish is bullshit. not really speaking to me yeah yeah, yeah. yeah oh it's got the semi wash finish i'm not really into that or like i don't really fuck with rosewood next but like maybe if i change the hardware and that like we're fucking nerds right straight up and that's cool but you know, like people don't have that luxury in like Cuba. It's like, oh, six people are going to share one fucking Fender Squire bass because that's all they can afford. Yeah. And like taped up and shit because that's just what it is. So mm. it, it like, it took me going to those places to realize like, oh, fuck, we got a lot here. Oh, yeah. that's actually. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really realize like, you know, all, all if you, I feel like if you don't travel or even like move around, if you just stay in your like little bubble, you just think that's how the rest of the world is. And like, you know, totally. 
like I'm originally from Winnipeg. And then when I moved to Calgary, which is a, a lot, a much larger city, like hearing people complain about how long it takes to get across the city. I'm like, you don't even know Winnipeg transit is the worst. Like, <laughs> so yeah, it's a, it's, it's definitely important to, I guess, check your privilege at the door, especially when there are certain things. Um, and just be more positive, like being stoked that yeah. like there are bands that are happening in these places around the world. Like that makes me super excited. Um, and I'm sure there might be a few people listening who are like, I never thought about touring Cuba, but like, maybe I should look into that. So yeah, that's it's really awesome. cool. Yeah. Those people are like hyped. Mm -hmm. They're so psyched to see you. So like, if you were to go to like a country like Cuba, for example, like that is not the first thing I would say is like, that's not a tour you'd make money. That is a tour where like you have to be willing to lose money. Cause like, those people do not have the money to buy a $15 like USD shirt. Like they sure. fucking don't. But I will say if you ever get the chance to, those people are just like, they're so fucking hyped. And, um, you know, even lightly touching on like Cuban punk scene, like Cuban punk is like, has a really rich and fucking like real DIY, like um, history to it. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, during the cold war like being like being a punk was a real fuck you to the government and yeah. mm. a lot of people worked around like if you were a punk in cuba during that time like you're 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 against the establishment you're against like all these things and if you were a punk during that time you straight up got excommunicated from your fucking family from your communities like you were not welcome you would get the shit kicked out of you yeah. by the cops you would get thrown in jail and like the government took care of the people, but if you were a punk, which is, you know, against the man, then, like, you were left for fucking dead. And, the you know, there's, like, a group of, like, these uh, Cuban punks called Los Rikis where they found a work a workaround to, you know, kind of stay true to, like, who they were and, like, you know, what they believed in by purposely infecting themselves with HIV. Because if you were sick with HIV the government had to take care of you regardless of what you were. So you had people oh, who wow. making, yeah. Like people don't fucking That's realize crazy. this. And like, could you fucking imagine like people get uppity about like, you know, like, Oh, someone told me I can't like wear this type of shirt or whatever. And then it's like, could you fucking imagine being so like in a, in a, in a situation where you are so committed to what you believe in that you are willing to make yourself actually sick with at the time it was a killing like a disease that killed the shit out of you right so that you could continue to be like this is who i am and this is what i am um i would yeah i would like highly encourage people to be able to check it out because yeah you know, would like if you were to ask people like would you infect yourself purposely with a life-threatening disease would you infect yourself with the coronavirus so you could go to a yeah, hardcore show yeah. like that's kind of the if same you, thing <laughs> if you had your homie with coronavirus like come up to you and say like Will you sneeze in my face for the sake of coronavirus? <laughs> like for the sake of punk and hardcore? Right. Would you do? It? Fuck no, we wouldn't. So like, sorry, bro. I'm just gonna stay at home. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So that's like that. Like we don't fucking know that. We don't have to think about that. So like you know, getting to go there and getting to like meet a lot of those people who are in those communities and stuff was fucking cool. And that is like I don't know. To me, I'm like that is really cool that you are willing to die for what you believe in yeah so like, it's like getting to work, like non-traditional places like that like you get to learn a lot you get to learn, meet a lot of really fucking cool people yeah um do you want to quickly shout out any cuban hardcore or punk bands that either you got to play shows with that you know if someone's like yeah like i do want to learn more about just that scene overall off the top of my head i can't remember so here's the other thing as well is it's hard to keep up with who's happening where because social media is really heavily restricted and sure. like getting yeah. access to recordings is really hard so i right now like i don't know who's still there um off the top of my head i can't remember who they are like maybe i can like send you something to like put it, like the links at the bottoms yeah. um but yeah i off the top of my head i can't think of anything i would just say like if you have the chance to go to a show in cuba like fucking do it yeah and, and yeah, if there's anyone who's listening, who's like, I really do want to like, I'll chat with Steph and we can do some research and just include those notes, um, in the yeah. show notes. Um, so to kind of transition back to some more, uh, North American tour stuff. So, uh, punitive damage is the other band that, uh, you're doing vocals in, 
Um, mm-hmm. So can you kind of do like kind of give me the intro around that? Because you guys recently just put out some some new music um, and then we can kind of transition into uh, the Scowl Tour. Yeah. So like, wait, was what? Oh, just as far as like, how did that <laughs> band form? Like, did you just have an itch that like, because that's not the first band that you were doing vocals in, but like you probably no. just like, okay, I want to do this again. Was that kind of the, the thought process? Kind of yes and no. So um, me, me, my brother Mike, and our uh, former guitar player, Kenny Lush at the time, we were like all kind of at this position where we were in bands that, you know, we wanted things to happen, but they weren't happening at the rate that we wanted to. Or there was like, there were some stalls or just like, for whatever reason, things weren't like, we weren't able to like get these bands to like tour and go do stuff. Yeah. And like, we were like collectively frustrated. And Mike and I had these old recordings um, with that that we had written with uh, Alex, our drummer, from before of like music that we were, like we were always super proud of, but like we just never did anything with them. Sure. And Kenny Lush was kind of the catalyst, and he's just like, let's just bug, like, why don't we just start a band? Like, why don't we just go start a band that does the things that we want to do? And like we were at like the Palette Coffee on like the corner of night in kingsway like i remember this distinctly um we were waiting to go like for breakfast or some shit and that's when we were like huh yeah like what maybe we can take the old recordings we have and put some vocals over top of it and see like maybe see if we can do something with this um i originally didn't want to be the singer uh just because like being a being like running a band is like I, to me it's hella scary uh and it's also like that is your your voice is your instrument and you can't switch that out right. you can't put in new pickups you can't put on new strings like what you have is what you have and you need to learn to work with what you have mm. and those songs were like to me I'm like those songs are like so cool and so raging that i was like i don't know that i could do this but the main motivating factor and this sounds real bad is that I had been in bands that had been ruined because of singers who had really bad singeritis, and like singeritis. Got... Yeah. Can you break that down? <laughs> singeritis is like just another way of describing somebody who's like, it's a way of singling out singers as like divas. Ah, uh, like see. singeritis being like, well, I don't want to do this, and my say is like the only say. Gotcha. So there was a lot, there were bands that I had played where like the singer called all the shots. So like. You know, you couldn't do anything without the singer because, like, you know, the band wants to go on tour, but like the guitar player can't go. Like, you can swap out the guitar player if they're okay with that, right? You can swap sure. out the, you can get a fill in drummer, but like, you can't really get a fill in vocalist without it getting weird. Sure. Yeah, um, I agree with that. So, like, I had a lot of bands that were kiboshed because of like things like that. And so I was like, if we are going to have these songs out there, this can, I can, I, and with good conscience, could not put that responsibility on anybody else. I cannot guarantee that another singer can't fuck this up, but I can guarantee that I won't fuck it up and I won't be the one to stop things from happening. Right. So that's actually the main motivating factor of like why I was like, okay, I'll sing. Yeah. Because I'm like, I can count on myself to make sure that if we ever get presented with like a tour or like a show and stuff, I'm not going to be the one who'd be like, no, we're not doing this. Right. Yeah. So it was kind of like my way of ensuring that the band was going to do something. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, I think that there's like, it's always a, it's a weird balance of like finding people who are like good at their instrument, but also like they want to do shit, but at the same time, like you enjoy hanging out with them. And sometimes yeah. like that trio is, is hard to, to land. And it's, it's kind of rare. Like some people are super good and they're homies. Um, but they don't want to tour so like they just kind of yeah. stay in their region and then there's people that they're our homies and then they want to tour but they suck live like there's you know the yeah. trifecta is uh is is very rare um like a three-way venn diagram yes absolutely yeah <laughs> um so as far as like um you guys have put out two i guess eps or demos whatever yeah. you kind of want to call it um, and then your newest release, that's kind of, you guys put that out and you hit the road kind of immediately after. Um, 
was... we we went on tour first and then we released those songs. Oh, okay. So it was flip flopped. Um, but yeah. <laughs> as far as the the timing of when you guys went out, that was kind of right when COVID nineteen was starting to like hit like North America as a whole. So like, um, yeah. I. I'm always trying to be conscious for anyone who's listening and they're just like so fatigued with like COVID-19 communication or, you know, media. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of interested cause like, um, you know, as you guys were announcing shows, I was like, I want you guys to finish this tour versus like having to read the, because of this, like we, we have to turn around and go and go home. Um, so yeah. tell me what your experience was and what was going through your head through that tour. I'm going to be completely honest, like when leading up to that tour and um, as that tour was happening, like I did not think that this, uh, that like the COVID stuff was as serious as it was. Like in my head, I was like, we're fucking freaking out again about something that like isn't really that big an issue. Like we do this every time we're breaking out. Like we need to chill out. Like I had like my sister calling me being like, you shouldn't be doing this tour. Um, but, but it wasn't as bad, like when before and as we were on it, it wasn't as bad. Right. Yeah. Um, Cause this so was I like really- very <laughs> beginning of March, essentially when you guys started it. Yeah. Yeah yeah. 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 Exactly. And like at the time there was like a couple cases, like, I don't know when the first confirmed case was in BC, but it was probably around that time. So it's still like, it just wasn't real to me. So all of us were just kind of like, eh. and then, you know, I would consider us extremely lucky that like we booked it at the time that we had did, because I think we were even like before when we were originally planning it, like we almost booked it a week later and oh, like, okay. for yeah, yeah. sure that would have been fucking canceled if we booked it a week later. Yeah. So I cannot like, I'm so thankful that we were able to get in while we could. And like it ended at the, like it ended at the perfect time because I had, um, RJC was supposed to go do a string of shows over in Texas and like it was like literally we played our lot like the last PD show was on a Thursday in LA and literally Friday afternoon you know the like the major shows over in Texas were getting canceled and then Saturday Disneyland got shut the fuck down everything was getting shut the fuck down Canadians were being told to get home everything got canceled like every at that point it started reaching the like minute by minute updates yeah so it really snowballed really quickly um and so like the only thing like we talk about this all the time where we're like we cannot believe how much we lucked out yeah being able to do that at that time because like you know now the borders are shut like we probably wouldn't have been able to get into america at that time and like at that point too with like everyone getting sick like that straight up would have just been irresponsible like now now that i see it for what it is i'm like oh fuck yeah that would have been a bad move yeah and and i think it's like any person like including myself it, it's like you see stuff and you just like you can't at least for me like there are certain things that you can't even really grasp because yeah. like like growing up like i remember when like 9 11 happened it was like oh like i don't really understand this and as i got o- older it's like oh like like this is the implications and this is how it actually affects our society now but i'm sure like for people in new york like it was almost like a a regional like obviously a bigger deal in the states and obviously a bigger way bigger deal for people that live in new york there um but <laughs> this has really touched every part of the world like every industry that you can name off the top of your head like Oh, you yeah. know, it, it's, it's been really surreal to even like, think like, okay, I've been home for like the last three weeks only have gone out to do like groceries and dog park and, yeah. and that's really it. Um, but yeah, so that, that probably was kind of, you know, you know, someone looking out for you in a way, cause you literally went at a, at a crossroads, like, okay, I finished this tour and I'm supposed to go and do this other thing, but this is mm-hmm. happening. So I should probably you know, pack my bags and, and get home. Um, yeah. 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 It's it, it like in a lot of ways, like it still doesn't feel real to me. Cause like, I just feel like I'm living in like, those like, you know, like, I feel like I'm living like the movie, like contagion or like whatever, right. you know, outbreak. like it, it still doesn't register that this is like my day to day. Yeah. Um, and like, there are parts of me, like I, there are times where I'm just like, 
fuck, that might have been the irresponsible thing to have done. But I don't know. Like, I, again, like, I would consider, like, punitive damage and scout. Like, I would consider us fucking lucky that we were able to get at least one of the last West Coast tours in before, like, everything has, like, as of now, completely shut the fuck down. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess it's, like, up to personal opinion, whether it's, like, you know, because the last thing that like the the thing that i hate is like seeing videos of like people policing like social distancing for like someone at a dollarama it's like no like this is my cousin like someone i'm related to and you're yelling at me because we're standing next to each other like that shit i don't think is good but then there's also like like i think it's like you guys just could see the storm and your you know little tour van was just like just a a little bit ahead of it in a way um just a hair just a just just a a hair hair. yeah um (laughs) i saw that you guys played under a bridge um and at least like i'll just (laughs) share my little like anecdote like from the outside like i i either it was you or someone else because i know like ravi was filling in on guitar for that tour um it it was like a note and it was like um this is the address on Google Maps. Walk down, and then it's like under the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, the venue is under the bridge, and I'm like, no, the venue is like the space under the bridge. Um, yeah. So it's a can you? Patch. Yeah. So like, at least when you were like, like that was uh, somewhere in California. So when you guys were like setting up that show, someone's like, yeah, mm-hmm. I got a venue, and it was like under a bridge, or was that like a last minute? Uh, switch that needed to happen no that was straight up like from the get-go so malachi and i were talking a lot malachi plays uh guitar and skull and so he was just like he originally like planned it with some friends of ours in uh, chico and he was like originally a little afraid to propose it to us to be like yo there's a generator show happening under a bridge and he's just like fuck what if they hate it what if they think it sucks right and it's like he hit me up about he's like how do you feel about a generator show it's like that sounds fucking bomb we're in um so that was like the plan from the get-go was to play this generator show yeah and uh we were driving from portland that day so that's like an eight-hour drive so we pull up and like in my mind i was like oh you know like maybe it's under a bridge but like maybe there's some kind of like setup there like who knows and then we get there and then it's just like it's under a freeway and it's like a dirt patch and right. this is where we're playing a show. Yeah. And this particular dirt patch under the freeway is like two miles away from a cop station, just up the street. Oh, so no. it was very much like we had to go in, making sure that, that like we weren't fucking loitering around in like high visible areas. Sure. And like when we were playing, we were like, we have to be back to back like super fast. We can't be dawdling. Like people can't be fucking around with their guitars. Like yeah. if we're turning on the generator, it's for you to play your set, play it, play it fast, and like turn it off, and we're gonna get the fuck out of here. <laughs> um, Cause we were like, you know, thankfully you have like trucks and cars coming over top of us. So like you couldn't immediately hear us, yeah. but there was definitely like, you would see like moms and like grandmas, like taking their dogs for a walk. And then you have this, like, you know, no you have this gas they're just like, uh, <laughs> yeah, just like walking by being like, I wonder what's happening. And then we'd like turn on our amps and you could see them just be like, I'm fucking out of here. Yeah. Like, I don't know what this is. <laughs> just like so full funny. on U-turn. <laughs> yeah um i always imagine like cool. what the stories are like what they they're like like henry you won't imagine what i saw when yeah. i was taking sparky <laughs> out on a walk today like man exactly. that's hilarious um yeah it was it was super cool like the show was done like we were fast so there was like four bands that played um oh so it wasn't and- even like there was four bands like i i, I thought it was just the two but that's, <laughs> that's- <laughs> there's like i think there's four maybe there was five bands I can't remember. Right. Um, But like, yeah, we were super quick. We were very back to back. Um, The only thing that was like difficult was like we were playing on a dirt patch. So like when like kids are like moshing and going off, they're kicking up a lot of dirt. So there'd be points where like I would get a good like suck in of dirt and I would like to breathe. Mm. Um, And so like that could be a little trickier. Like sometimes you get sand in your eyes and you'd be like, I don't know what, like, where am I right now? Yeah. Um, But it's fucking cool. Like, I like that kind of stuff. Like I like, you know, getting to do something different and like, yeah, why the fuck not play like a generator show? Like yeah. those yeah. are the stories that are like the most interesting and like the most fun. I don't know. Like it was something to look forward to. Did it sound great? Like, 
no. You know, I can't imagine the acoustics under a bridge, you know, is going to sound like yeah, yeah, yeah. standard. Yeah. yeah. But like, was it cool as shit? Yeah, man. It was so fun. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like I was just thankful that like someone got a cell phone video so I could like actually like see it and, you know, that becomes something that I can ask you on the podcast versus like, you know, I'm a firm believer of like, there are thousands upon thousands of like cool hardcore stories that like don't have a video or a photo that someone can like back it up in a way. Yeah. So like, you know, like I put out a podcast today with Lance and he was mentioning on how his band, uh, he brought nunchucks to a show and he like threw them in the, in the crowd <laughs> and, uh, Sonny was filming that. And like, I slammed the, just that like little section just after he said it. And I'm like, man, yeah. that shit is so like, that just makes it like a perfect combination in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like those are like the, that kind of shit's the most memorable. And it's just the most fun to like tell your friends and like think back on. Right. Cause it's like house shows are like, house shows are cool. Venue's cool. Obviously don't get me wrong. But like, sometimes you want to talk about like, yeah, that one dumbass time we were like, let's fucking wreck a gas generator and play a show under a bridge. Like why the fuck not? Yeah. Yeah, like, um, I think, you know, and I've said it so many times, like on this podcast and, and just in life, just being so psyched on like the fact that hardcore is just filled with no um, standards as far as music, uh, like venue, like venues. And I, I totally agree. Like when I think about like all time greatest, like, um, like hardcore sets played in odd venues. Like there's all these weird things. Like I've seen photos of bands playing in like a bathroom. Um, I remember <laughs> like expires like canceled or whatever, but there's a video of them playing Portland uh, at this place called Burgerville. And I think yeah. they open up the set being like, all right, this is a little weird, but let's get a little weirder. And then just people just like going off with like, you can see the cars in the, in the, in through the glass and they're still yeah. doing the drive through and all the employees are just like what's happening so like <laughs> shit like that at least for me like if i need to show people a reason to like give like hardcore tries as, as far as being a fun style of music it's like name any other genre of music that allows that has people playing in a denny's or whatever it is yeah um, totally and, ma and make it work if it was like some country blues thing it just feels like what are you doing here but like when yeah. it's hardcore it's like like you you shouldn't be here but because you are here it's almost perfect in a way <laughs> yeah 100 percent. Yeah. yeah sweet well uh we're kind of getting at the time where we can kind of start to wrap up the podcast um stuff the way that we kind of um end the the show here is a memorable show or favorite mosh story that you can kind of send off everyone with. And that doesn't need to necessarily be like, I punched this dude in the face. It could just be something that you saw at a show and it just like, like imprinted on your mind. Yeah. Um, damn. I think the one, I, I don't know if it was like one show or if it was a string of shows, but I, I think some of my favorite things that I, or like one of my favorite things I remember seeing was, I can't, I straight can't remember who was playing, but it was a DPK show over at 3P3, bless, may it rest in peace. Mm. Um, some band was playing, everybody was going off, there was a ton of people there, there was, like, everyone was having such a good time, and then at some point in the show, I don't know who it was, I don't know who was the one who did it and who was the one who was in it, but somebody decided to take one of the garbage cans at like the side or the front of the venue, empty it out, and then just put it on top of their homies and kick them into the pit. And then you just had a garbage can with legs like moshing into other people. And I feel like I there love seems that to visual. Be, there's just like a consistent theme of like Vancouver hardcore and the fucking garbage can coming back at some point. So it was right. either like, I don't know if this was at one show or if this is a couple shows. And then there was the, um, uh, there was that, I, I don't know if it was like the last two through three show and like, well, world view was playing, but like, you know, you got this like cool video of like it's atmosphere. I wasn't there for it, but I was watching like everybody's videos, Right. but it's like, 
tons of people there like the mood's like heavy and stuff like they're just like feeding back or whatever and like you have like I think it's like Andy Numata is over like their guitar player is just like over and you just see him look over and kind of move to the side because somebody had thrown a garbage can at him <laughs> and so like the garbage can came back yeah. <laughs> after like years of not being around wow um so just like that kind of shit I the the 333 garbage can I really hold a special place in my heart and I hope <laughs> to see some rendition of that in the future somewhere else yeah yeah hopefully it lives on um i'll i'll <laughs> i'll just i'll echo your um garbage can appreciation because that brought up i haven't thought about this in in years but there there was one show that i was playing uh it was at the purple room in winnipeg it was like a kind of diy space um kind of just like white walls and uh I think Extract, that was the band I was playing in, uh, we were playing, and, like, someone grabbed the garbage can and threw it, but it, like, still had garbage in it, so, like, just <laughs> shit flying everywhere, and it was, like, during the, it was during the last song, last breakdown, and then as soon as the set is over, like, and I think this is just, like, textbook hardcore, because everyone's just, like, going, like, yeah, just shit is going everywhere and as soon as everything's over everyone like okay and picks it up and puts it back in the garbage like immediately like responsibility <laughs> kicked in and you know everyone so nice up. yeah exactly <laughs> um but you know just like i can't believe that that happened so shout out to the garbage can moshers um yeah. in vancouver <laughs> and around the world um steph thank you so much for coming on and sharing some some stories and some perspectives um i think this has been super valuable and hopefully gives um, some insight on a, a number of topics that we covered. Um, as far as how people keep up with you, keep up with your bands, are there any like social tags that you want to kind of say and yeah. I'll just kind of include them? Yeah. So, uh, Regional Justice Center is on Twitter and like Instagram. You just look up Ian's Instagram. So I think it's like Ian Patrick Shelton. Yeah. Um, yeah, Peter Damage has a Twitter. If people want to like, we don't have an Instagram, but if people want to say what's up, uh, my Instagram is up. So it's like Steph X Tracova. Uh, you know, people are welcome to say what's up, say hi. Um, and then you can find us, you can find RGC on like Spotify, Apple Music, Bandcamp, same thing with Punitive Damage. Uh, yeah, you like, if you do a simple Google search, you'll find us pretty quickly. Yeah. Cool. And yeah, I highly recommend listening to the new, uh, new ish regional justice center and the punitive damage stuff as well. And, uh, again, thank you so much for coming on and, uh, shooting the shit yeah. with me. It was super fun. Yeah, man. Thank you so much for having me. This was such a nice thing to do under quarantine. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, <laughs> that's the goal here. So thanks again for listening. Hell yeah.